Mercedes presents the new S-Class, and it sets new standards in terms of both technology and comfort. The latest edition is available with a short or long wheelbase. You can choose between one diesel engine and two gasoline units, generating between 190 and 335 kilowatts of power. There's also a hybrid option. Creating a new S-Class is always a big challenge, explains head designer Gordon Wagner. There's also responsibility because the S-Class is the ultimate expression of the brand. As ever, there's luxury galore. The car simply oozes class and quality. The panel in front of the driver is digital and displayed on a large screen. A panoramic glass roof translates into a very spacious feel, while the electronically adjustable seats leave nothing to be desired in terms of comfort. The subtle changes from its predecessor and other models will be immediately apparent to eagle-eyed experts, however. Jens Stratmann is one of them. The new car is a bit lighter, he notes. There are fewer buttons and, of course, the big displays. Why take second best with the S-Class? We put the most powerful version through its paces, the S500 V8 with a 4.6-liter displacement and 335 kilowatts of power. The luxury sedan makes the dash to 100 kilometers per hour in a sporty 4.8 seconds and can accelerate with ease up to 250 Ks. Official fuel consumption is 8.6 liters per 100 kilometers. And there's certainly no shortage of assists. Magic Body Control is the app name for an intelligent suspension system. Mercedes is the only marquee to feature active suspension, Hermann Josef Storp explains. Stereo cameras are used to detect holes or bumps in the road. The system then guides the wheels over these irregularities, each wheel individually. This keeps the form of the vehicle on the same level. The car can absorb up to 20 centimeters difference in height, ironing out any bumps. Customers will also have the highest expectations on the visual front, where the S-Class has at times divided opinion. Proportions are crucial for the head designer. Mercedes has classic rear-wheel drive proportions, he says. The new S-Class has an even longer hood, so that the car sits even more on the rear axle. Mercedes emphasizes that with its hallmark dropping line, which falls away at the back, and the undercut. The result are these wonderfully bold flanks eben diese tollen vollen Flächen zu machen bei dem Fahrzeug. And the traditional star on top of the radiator is also crucial of course. It stands for the S class and for a 125 year heritage. Mercedes has reworked it for the next generation. First, it's almost twice the size and it's become more three dimensional. It exudes a lot more status. Es hat also viel mehr Auftritt, viel mehr Status, ja. Then there's the daytime running light eyebrow, which will be a new brand signature. It's another immediate sign of a Mercedes, in addition to the grill. These eyebrows give the car a very distinguished look. The S-Class is the first vehicle in history to replace all light bulbs with LEDs. It has almost 500 for lighting up the road as well as the interior. The front passenger seat can be reclined forward electrically to provide more leg room behind. The rear seats offer their occupants a choice of seven massage programs. Normally Jens Stratmann and his fellow journalists argue over who gets to drive first. Today it's the opposite. Everyone wanted to sit in the back. And it's a great ride, he assures us. He has an incredible amount of leg room. That's in the long version, of course. He also has fantastic headroom and home comforts like this lovely pillow. So does he have any gripes at all? Jens did his utmost to find one, and eventually did. The car has 20-plus assist systems, but he still had to start the engine using a key. Sasha is gladly taking up a test drive offer at this dealership. 
The new Renault Captur is even more compact than a VW Golf. He wonders whether the little car can meet Renault's expectation that it will get sales figures back on track. The new model measures 4.12 meters in length, bridging the gap between the new Clio and the Clio Grand Tour. Renault's aim here, says Sasha, is to score with the low entry-level price, meaning there's no four-wheel drive option. Perhaps there's no space to accommodate it with the Clio platform, on which the Captur is based. At the moment, the newly launched Renault Captur is available with only three different engines, so not yet the wide-range scene with the Clio. Even if the Cup Tour does share the cutting-edge platform with the Clio, its ground clearance is 17 centimeters higher. That makes the model well-equipped for excursions taking in farm lanes and dirt roads. And it's precisely this robust character that the exterior design emphasizes. Sasha recognizes the familiar cabin, largely the same as in the Renault Clio. That means hard plastic, and above all, a couple of sharp edges on the steering wheel that have not been improved. He reckons you'll touch these edges too often, which he personally would find very annoying. But Renault has come up with a new idea for the club compartment. It's a drawer rather than a door that opens downwards. That means the front passenger needs to be careful not to get their legs in the way. One nice side effect is that the drawer has an 11 liter capacity. Nice for keeping your drinks cool. Rear passengers can look forward to the windows opening all the way down. Although, they'll need that fresh air, says Sasha, because the Captur suspension is a bit too soft. The back seat can be shifted 16 centimeters in the long version, meaning that leg room should never be a problem. If you don't need that extra space for passengers, the trunk capacity can be extended from 377 to 455 liters. With the rear seats folded down, the cargo area can be increased to 1,235 liters. The variable trunk floor means you have a close-to-flat cargo surface. So the Captur does impress with its variability and practical attributes. Unfortunately, says Sasha, the A-pillar has gotten a little too big. Around bends, you have to tilt your head pretty radically to be able to see properly. We tested the 90 DCI diesel version. Its 66 kilowatts of output give it a peak speed of 171 kilometers per hour. Renault says it's economical, needing just 4.2 liters of diesel for 100 kilometers. And the verdict? The Captur is a very useful mini SUV, but Sasha advises against the smallest gasoline engine because it makes you feel underpowered. There are two other engines available, however, so there should be something to cover everyone's tastes. Jeep is presenting its new look Grand Cherokee. Its 8-speed automatic transmission reduces fuel consumption by around 10%. The facelift has given the Jeep a sportier appearance, with a 7-slat grille and LED headlights. In Germany, a top-of-the-range 3.0-liter turbo diesel Grand Cherokee will set you back 65,500 euros. The new generation Lexus IS is being introduced as a full hybrid the four-wheel drive, mid-size sedan offers the same thrilling, fast-paced drive, but with greater fuel efficiency. The IS F Sport model has slick design features, like a chrome-plated Diablo radiator grille, front underbody spoilers, and LED fog lights.
Car tester Matis Kurat says Volvos have always had a reputation for being safe cars, last but not least because of the tough steel used to make them. But today, he adds, safety means more than a solid car with good crash test results. It's all about electronics that are supposed to prevent accidents now. Volvo's a leader here, and Matis says he's flown to Gothenburg, Sweden to find out more firsthand. Volvo's new road edge and barrier detection system with steer assist recognizes possible dangers and automatically detects unintentional lane deviations, meaning the driver is always supported by automatic steering impulses. What looks like a technical gimmick at first glance should later help traffic slow more smoothly all by itself. Parking is the first place Volvo is trying to make its autos autonomous. A driver can use a smartphone to tell the car to find a parking space on its own aided by sensors and GPS. If it comes across other vehicles, obstacles or pedestrians, the car stops and waits until its path is clear. It seems to work like a charm, but Volvo says it will take some time before it's ready for series production. I would say that somewhere around five to ten years from now we can see cars parking autonomously in, in a parking lot. But there are of course also other issues that need to be, to be discussed and resolved regarding legal aspects and, and liability issues and, and so there are many pieces of the puzzle of autonomous parking that need to be solved in order to, to make this into an end product. Once the car has found its own parking space and parked, it turns off its engine. Connected to a smartphone, the car can even find its way back to you. The city safety system detects large animals, such as moose, for example. In critical situations, the car will stop itself. Volvo already brought pedestrian protection a big step forward a few years ago with the city safety system. It has its own eyes with which to determine whether someone is currently crossing the road and brakes automatically. And the new system is designed to work at night as well. And to the dummy's relief, it works. The camera has a range of exposure settings so that even in the dark it can detect an object in front of the car and react accordingly. Sounds and LEDs are used to alert drivers. If they fail to take action, the vehicle will. Matis remembers his dad's car having cruise control when he was a boy. All the driver had to do was steer and brake. Back then, he wondered how great it would be if the car could also do the braking automatically. That's nothing special these days. It's called adaptive cruise control. It modifies your speed to the car in front. All that's left to do is the steering. Until now, Volvo is looking at a future where you do no steering at all. Adaptive cruise control with steer assist. Why did the idea only occur to them now? Well, we've been dreaming about self-driving cars for a long time. But now the sensor technology, the radars, the camera is finally so mature that we actually can steer the car automatically. But Matas wants to know how it works. Well, the, the radar and the camera, they detect the car in front. So they know the distance to the car in front and they know the angle to the car in front. And this car is controlled in such a way that it tries to follow the, tra the track of the car in front. Um, right now I can release the steering wheel, but when we put this in a production vehicle in a new XC90 next year, then it's required for the driver to keep the hand on the steering wheel to make sure that the driver is supervising the system. Mata says plenty of developments on the horizon will make driving even easier and safer. 
Car-to-car -car communication, as the name suggests, enables vehicles to exchange data in order to improve road safety. The system uses acoustic signals and icon alerts to warn the driver an approaching emergency vehicle, for example. It can also alert the driver to a breakdown out of sight around the corner. In situations where a brief distraction can be critical in terms of driver response times, the system is a potential lifesaver. So what has Montes found out today? The car of the future also breaks automatically in the dark and to avoid animals. It can navigate its own way through traffic and prevents me from coming off the road. It can park on its own and talk to its fellow cars. That means smoother traffic flow and fewer accidents. Some of the ideas are still pipe dreams and will need another 5, 10 or 15 years to be standard features. But the signs are clear. There's plenty of road ahead when it comes to safety technology and comfort. Die Reise in puncto Sicherheitstechnik und Komforttechnik im Auto lange noch nicht vorbei ist. The history of the Borgward Hansa Hepmüller convertible is as old as the history of the Federal Republic of Germany. And it looks like it's just driven out of a film from the post-war years. Then there's that old-fashioned metallic knocking sound of the 52-horsepower engine. Our test driver says he's driving a real luxury car, a Borgward Hansa 1500, built in 1951. The glittering gold of the steering wheel and instruments transport him back to the heydays of the West German economic boom. The Borgward was a bit of a miracle in post-war Germany. When it was introduced to the Geneva Motor Show in 1949, the Hansa 1500 blew the competition away. Opel, Ford, and Mercedes were still showing cars based on pre-war models from the 1930s. The Hansa's engine was superior too. The sleek four-cylinder motor boasted 52 horsepower, whereas the Mercedes 170V could only manage 45. Officially, this vehicle has a top speed of 120 kilometers per hour, our test driver says, but to reach it requires lots of time and nerve because the car is hard to handle. Because it lurches around so, he only got up to around 80, and that was enough. On the other hand, the rear swing axle, which makes the car so hard to handle, also ensures a surprisingly comfortable ride. Christoph Bauer says visually, it's like having the back of a whale in front of you. From this vantage point, people might think the car is huge, but that's not so. The Hansa was produced as a sedan, a station wagon, a box van, and even as a four-door luxury convertible with a Hapmüller car body like this model from the Zeithaus Museum in Wolfsburg. Christoph very quickly picked up on the car's biggest weakness, its transmission. He says having the shift on the steering column, the height of modernity in the 1950s, doesn't make things easier, as there's no direct access to the gears. It catches and jerks, but when it works, it works, he adds. Twenty-three thousand Hansa 1500s were built over the course of three years. There's something almost stately about driving a Borgward Hansa 1500, Christoph says, but in 1949 this car was absolutely state-of-the-art. It was the first German car with an American-style pontoon body. Still, he notes that it's very simple, with little in the way of chrome and trim. But the technology was very modern, independent suspension, electric turn signals, and starting in 1950, the first German-made automatic transmission, the Hansamatic. However, Christoph says that the VW Hapmüller looks much younger, fresher, almost eccentric, even though it uses much older shapes. Car body manufacturer Hapmüller transformed the VW Beetle into an iconic convertible. With its coquettish rounded back, completely retractable roof, and elegant two-tone paint job, 
the mass market vehicle was now a luxury car. But with its 25 horsepower engine, it remained down to earth. It seems to suit Christoph better than the Borgwart. Just two new models were marketed in Germany in 1949, the voluptuous Borgvard and the Schick Hapmüller convertible. They were the colorful cars of their day. In comparison to the Borgvard, Christoph says this VW drives in a wonderful manner that's almost lively and sporty. He says back then there were people who loved the extravagant and so Hapmüller was contracted to build 2,000 of these convertibles. They built just 696 though because their production facilities burned down in 1949. <laughs> This tragic event has made the VW Hapmüller convertible into a much sought-after collector's item that sells for the price of a Ferrari. Just 100 of the convertibles are still around today. Christoph says, just like with the Borgvard, the VW also wanders around on the road. Its narrow tires and rear swing axle mean that you really have to concentrate to keep within the lane. When out for a drive, it's best to take the advice of Beetle developer Ferdinand Porsche and just let the 1.1 liter four cylinder engine rejoice. From zero to 150 seconds. <laughs> Not exactly a sports car, he exclaims. The car can only reach 105 kilometers an hour, but he says that doesn't matter. With the wind in your hair, you feel you're traveling fast. In its day, the VW Hapmüller cost 7,500 Deutschmarks, three times as much as a normal Beetle. The Hansa convertible sold for almost 11,500 marks. Christoph says if he had to choose between the two Hapmüller convertibles, he'd take the VW, because it handles better and he loves its shape. He says the instruments are a bit more reserved and spartan, but then again, he prefers understatement. To this day, both Hapmüller convertibles are still dream cars, and that's no understatement.